In this second module, we'll continue exploring the environmental influences that can affect us prenatally and even after we're born. Unlike the chromosomal difficulties that are basically brought forth by chance or because of our genetics, the environmental influences we'll be discussing today address environmental agents that can be prevented or avoided while the woman is pregnant. These are called teratogens. You may have also heard the pronunciation of teratogens. It basically is an environmental agent that can produce a birth defect in an individual. Teratogens could range from drugs, chemicals, viruses, or anything else. And one of the things we find is that while we are in the embryonic period, that is weeks two to eight, we're more likely to have a serious defect, something that's more noticeable. And the reason why is because, as you may remember, it is during that time that our uh, vital organs are developing, as well as our brain and our limbs and our faces. When we go over to the fetal period, the effect or the damage that can be brought about by teratogens is usually minor. And we don't necessarily want to downplay it because it could be something that could affect the individual for the rest of their life. But it's not likely to be seen as much uh, as if it were to have been during the embryonic period. Some of the teratogens that are of interest to researchers are the mother's nutrition, emotional state, drug use. As we look at mother's nutrition, we find that women who are undernourished are likely to give birth to children who are underweight. And as you will learn in also future slides, baby fat is essential for a baby to be able to fight disease and develop well. Uh, so therefore, an underweight baby is more vulnerable to suffer from uh, different diseases and poor mental development. A mother's emotional state also plays a key role in how uh, pleasant the child will be once born. We find that intense anxiety during pregnancy, especially during the last trimester for some reason, uh, tends to lead to irritable infant who would often sleep and eat poorly. Once again, without proper nutrition, the child is likely to be underweight and therefore more susceptible to illness and disease. Here are a few other teratogens that uh, are of interest, and these are, for the most part, um, pretty self-explanatory. Um, as you can see in here, alcohol um, can bring about uh, a very um, noticeable effect on a child, and that is based on what we call the FAS, or fetal alcohol syndrome. This is uh, on a spectrum uh, on the higher end of the effect that alcohol can bring about. And oftentimes one of the things we see is that uh, when the mother um, consumed alcohol in larger amounts than, um, than, than average, and if done while the child was developing in the embryonic stage, this can bring about facial deformities that are visible to many, and also mental retardation and, and growth delays. There are also good maternal factors. And exercising is one of those. Uh, pregnant women are encouraged to engage in exercise uh, on a regular basis. And some of the benefits of that would be reducing the high blood pressure that is often um, presented in women while they are pregnant. And also what they call gestational diabetes or pregnancy-induced maternal diabetes. A woman doesn't have to have a history of diabetes, but often during pregnancy... There are changes in their bodies, and their glucose level may fluctuate uh, in ways that are not consistent with her health before. Exercising allows them to keep these under control. Uh, and not to mention that uh, this has also been associated or correlated with um, f re the reduction of physical discomfort in the final weeks. Oftentimes, uh, during the last month, uh, you'll hear of uh, individuals complaining of back pain, and upward pressure on the chest that would bring about difficulties breathing. And we find that the more women exercise, uh, the easier it is for them to be able to overcome this or reduce the effects of these. Here you can see uh, an important aspect of pregnancy, and that is the nutrition. Please note, 
and I will not go into this in detail. But please note the increase in calories that should occur. Uh, also pay particular attention to the ideal weight gain. And uh, also know that in order for women to have a healthy pregnancy, um, vitamin mineral enrichment is essential. And we find that while all of them are essential uh, and important, the folic acid, uh, which is a derivative of vitamin B, uh, is essential for healthy uh, brain development. Uh, poor nutrition, as stated before, during pregnancy can lead to a series of, of, uh, of characteristics in a child. And some of the things we find is that if the mother is undernourished or eating inadequately during pregnancy, um, the baby is likely to be passive and withdrawn, um, which may result again in poor eating habits and not sleeping well, which may come susceptible to illness. Unfortunately, uh, not a lot of women in the United States uh, seek prenatal care. Um, we hope that with changes in our legislation and with access to health care, uh, a growing number of women will begin to seek prenatal care with their doctors. About 8% are pregnant women in the United States often wait until after the first trimester. And if we break up trimesters or pregnancy into trimesters, we're talking about uh, until the fourth month. Um, this is often seen in individuals who lack health insurance or who have uh, lower socioeconomic status. Uh, we also find that uh, public education for prenatal care would be essential to care for the baby and the woman uh, better. Um, we find that uh, doctors oftentimes who lack uh, a culturally sensitive practice or view uh, are likely to disappoint or discourage uh, regular visits from their clients excuse me, from their patients. And so the push by a lot of uh, other OBGYN uh, providers is to be able to be sensitive and uh, adjust to the culturally uh, diverse uh, clientele that they may have in there. Some things that are also essential and seen more commonly among individuals who have a higher socioeconomic status are uh, those who uh, proactively uh, seek to become informed about parenting. Uh, reading books and staying socially connected is essential as uh, mothers often rely heavily on, on their own mothers or their friends to be able to sleep. Uh, taking care of a newborn can be draining physically. Uh, a lot of emotions that are also pleasant but they can also drain us. So seeking effective parenting models and, and support is essential. Um, to be able to do this better. Um, the consideration of uh, our own culture if is the choice to uh, bring this forth on the child and encourage the child or expose them to the culture is essential to discuss um, before the child arrives and also the relationship between the couple is essential for a healthy outcome. We find that if there is a burnout or uh, exhaustion in the parents it is possible that the child will not receive the best care. As you read the definition of this in here, you'll find that the, what was just described here is a neonate, or also known as a newborn. The next slides will look at the words lanugo, uh, we'll look at vernix, and some of the other characteristics that are seen here. As mentioned, the vernix is a white greasy covering for protection before birth. In fact, it gives way to a more pale uh, baby when we're born. But it is designed to protect us from all the uh, pollutants that are in the air. You, Before we're born, we are in an enclosed environment and suddenly we are exposed to a lot of skin cells that are floating in the air. So the vernix and lanugo, which is a uh, a soft fuzz that covers the entire body uh, serve a purpose to protect us from from these free-floating things. The eyelids are often uh, closed uh, or, or swollen because of uh, our posture before we are born which is upside down. Uh, because of that the fluids accumulate at the, in the eyes and there are uh, some theories that state that we also get ready to be exposed to sunlight. If you've 
gotten up in the middle of the night to use the restroom and suddenly are exposed to a bright light, you know that it's uncomfortable. Uh, having a child be in a womb where it's completely dark and then uh, coming out to light is also uncomfortable. So the eyelids, uh, the swelling of the eyelids is also believed to facilitate a gradual exposure to the light. Um, these features that are not necessarily uh, pleasant often thankfully disappear within the first two weeks. A child is born in three different stages. Stage one is the dilation or the effacement of the cervix. Uh, we're not talking about the vaginal canal but the cervix which is basically the entrance into the uterus. The opening of the cervix is called the os, uh, written O-S, and that basically is what needs to dilate. Uh, this is the longest stage um, for a birth, and for the first birth is about 12 to 14 hours, whereas for subsequent births it could be from 4 to 6 hours. Um, there are often these very powerful contractions that uh, as each occurs, they cause the cervix to dilate and to also get thinner. Um, the contractions uh, typically are forceful and regular, about 20, 10 to 20 minutes apart, and last about 15 to 20 seconds. As they get closer to the second stage, the uh, contractions start getting closer together every two to three minutes, but they last longer. On the second stage, we often have the delivery of the baby, and this lasts for about 50 minutes for the first birth and about uh, 20 to 30 minutes for the second and subsequent births. Now, the contractions will continue and they are helpful with uh, pushing the baby out. Um, the contractions have a, um, a very uh, essential value in the child being alert and also, uh, as we will discuss later, their ability to go on for extended periods of time without oxygen. Uh, and also it is in the second stage where the infant is born. Now, the crowning is basically where the vaginal opening stretches around the entire head. And, and that is seen as a milestone uh, that typically uh, some people argue that it would be downhill thereafter. The third stage is basically after the child has been delivered, uh, but the placenta uh, is still uh, attached in there. So it isn't until the third stage where um, there are still some contractions and this would cause the placenta to separate from the uterus. Now, uh, some women report that they still feel the contractions. Others don't remember contractions, and that may be because of a hormonal cocktail that is now part of the woman's uh, state of mind that allows her to focus entirely on the child and not on any of their discomfort. As uncomfortable as the contractions can be, uh, we find that the contractions in a woman allow the baby to produce and secrete stress hormones, cortisol. When we find uh, cortisol levels in childbirth, it basically allows them to go extended periods of time without oxygen. If for some reason there were to be an umbilical cord wrapped around the child's neck, uh, it could be detrimental and um, it could bring about a lot of brain damage as oxygen is what the cells require um, to, to be able to survive. Children who have had extended uh, oxygen deprivation times often have cerebral palsy, which could be manifested in different ways. Uh, so higher cortisol levels allow a child to go without oxygen for longer periods of time. The way this works is that with higher stress levels, there is a lot more arousal, which then allows us to pump blood into the brain and the heart, and that's what allows us to be deprived of oxygen for extended periods of time. It is also important for you to note that the average newborn, which is uh, what we call the neonates, is about 20 inches long and seven and a half pounds in the United States. With boys tend to be a little bit longer and heavier than girls. And you also see that in all babies, the head is often larger in comparison to the trunk and legs. As mentioned before, uh, preterm is not the same as premature. Premature basically means before reaching full maturation. And this is basically babies born three weeks or more before the end of a full 38-week pregnancy, or those who also weigh uh, less than five and a half pounds. Uh, we find that birth weight is a strong predictor of uh, survival, as again, baby fat is essential for healthy development and to fight uh, difficulties. 
anyone who is born uh, weighing less than three and a half pounds uh, likely to experience difficulties that will probably never be uh, overcome. And the difficulties are not limited to physical, but also cognitive and their intelligence capacity. Another word for also uh, individuals who may have been underdeveloped is uh, small for date. These are individuals who are below their expected weight um, considering the length of pregnancy. We find that uh, usually these individuals who are small for date have uh, more serious problems. Uh, the first year, if they're small for date, are more likely to die, uh, also catch infections and, and suffer from brain damage. And in middle childhood, if they don't die, then they're often smaller in stature with lower IQ scores, uh, less attentive and socially immature, which would be the uh, cognitive component. Again, a preterm are those who are born before the completion of the 37th week. Uh, these individuals are often cared for in an isolate, which is a, like an incubator made out of plexiglass, uh, and this is where they regulate the temperature for them. Oftentimes, uh, infants cannot regulate body temperature effectively, and that is uh, aggravated more so by being underweight or undernourished. Uh, when Individuals do not have access to isolates, uh, which again is this plexiglass incubator. We have found in uh, underdeveloped countries that uh, parents who lie there with uh, a bare chest, uh, often gently massaging the individual, uh, gives way to gaining weight faster and also growing faster. And this has been done in studies across the Philippines and uh, Eastern uh, uh, Asia in West Asia, where individuals often lack uh, medical uh, equipment and uh, access to some of these uh, other devices that will allow for the child to, to develop. Um, also the training of parents on preterm caregiving skills are essential for the child to succeed, um, providing adequate medical uh, care as well as cognitive stimulation and adequate parenting models as well as a stable economy. Uh, often gives way to uh, preterms who, when reared in two-parent middle socioeconomic status, uh, often uh, have uh, a very good quality of life as adults. However, if you were to compromise the socioeconomic status uh, or send them to poor quality schools with little to no access to medical or special services, they often feel the uh, effects of brain preterm.